tonight's topic, ASP.NET Core 1.0. So this is the, the newest version of the .NET framework with the newest version of ASP.NET. So I'm sure everybody has seen the, uh, the kerfuffle with name changes and all the other things that have come along down the line just to confuse us all. ASP.NET Core is a brand new framework. .NET Core is the brand new runtime. .NET Core is cross-platform. You can run it on Linux, you can run it on a Mac, you can run it everywhere. The cool thing that that allows us to do is run ASP.NET Core applications in Linux Docker containers. So this whole presentation, this whole conversation tonight is around running new .NET Core applications, ASP.NET based, in Linux containers. So it might be a little bit left field for everybody here because there's no Windows involved in this, but the idea is to get you into a place where you can potentially look at this set of technologies for your future development. So just to give you kind of a quick intro about me, um, obviously my name is Jeremy Cade. I'm a software engineer. I've been breaking things for about 15 years professionally, so people have been paying me to break their systems, which is great fun. Um, I have very strong opinions about a lot of things. Um, and a lot of the guys around SSW can tell you some of the horror stories of having to work with me with my very strong opinions. Um, but I too, too tend to have, uh, or subscribe to the idea of strong opinions weekly held. So if somebody comes to me with a better way of doing things, cool, I'm on board. Um, I have something that looks like a formal education, Bachelor of Information Technology and Masters of Information Technology. So, what are we going to cover? Well, I work at a little company called Loop in Brisbane. Um, I'm going to give you some background of where their services were at when I started with them and where we've started to migrate to and where .NET Core fits into our current set of architectures. Where Docker fits into that story and how you can utilize some of the tools around Docker. What ASP.NET Core, oh sorry, ASP.NET Core 1.0 on top of .NET Core looks like in a Docker container. And a very simplistic view of the build, test, deploy cycle with Docker. So it's really geared towards, you know, people that are brand new to this technology, coming from a Microsoft stack, um, and hopefully we'll give you a, a, a fairly solid starting point. So we'll jump right in. So Loop provides technology and services to large events. So we're talking things like uh, royal shows, um, home exhibitions, that type of thing. Um, we provide back-end services to the event organizers, so basically organizing the entire layouts, um, API systems to help them with ticketing, um, and a whole range of other services directly to the exhibitors. So we have a large number of services that we have to deal with, and they're all different aspects of the, of a, of the, uh, of the business, essentially. So we deal with online and on-site ticketing. So there's you know, our traditional web application plus iOS applications. We have uh, visitor registration, which is on-site as well, or can be off-site. Um, visitor communications, so things like mass mail-outs, media, SMS. So a lot of communication services that need to go back and forth. Uh, lead capture and generation, so we do QR code scanning, um, RFID scanning, all types of things, visitor tracking throughout event, uh, basically giant halls, work out where people are based on RFID signals. We have an event and a show app which basically gives visitors to that location or to that event some information about the show, contains things like digital show bags, and then we provide a, a full set of reporting and analytics back to the event organisers and the exhibitors. So. When I started with Loop, I've only been there for about three months, but when I started, we had a fairly solid .NET stack. So we had a large number of load balanced web front ends with six large monolithic .NET applications. When I say large, I mean large, very, very large applications. They've been built organically over five years. Um, we have a number of WCF applications. So basically all our APIs were sitting on top of WCF. So there was SOAP, XML, and JSON. So it was an absolute nightmare to deal with. Um, and a stack of Windows services to run background tasks. So we had two proper Windows services running all the time across all these machines. We have a number of iOS applications. So there were four iOS applications, some in Objective-C, some in Swift. Um, we have a thousand plus iOS devices out in the field at any given time. They can be iPhones, iPads, um, different versions of those devices in different configurations with different sets of software. We have fully virtualized infrastructure. So all of the infrastructure that supports all these software and services was all in AWS. Um, and we have a fairly solid performance monitoring stack because one of the things that we have to worry about is high availability. So we traditionally used uh, New Relic and Amazon CloudWatch, and we have a fairly solid testing and staging environment. What is CloudWatch? CloudWatch is very similar to Application Insight, so it's Amazon's version of New Relic, essentially. So you can get a lot of information about your VMs that way. Um, it is somewhat limited, but it does allow you to set 
uh, scale of scaling groups based on different indicators. And why did you need, need New Relic and CloudWatch? CloudWatch doesn't give you client side. Oh. So a big difference between the two there. New Relic gives you a whole set of server side analytics, SQL Server analytics, plus client side and iOS analytics. So I gave me the full stack, essentially. CloudWatch just gives me the Amazon infrastructure. So the bad side of all this though, because not everything's perfect in every shop, is it? We had a lot of manual testing, so there was no automated testing whatsoever, no unit testing, no integration tests, nada. But we had high availability services, which I really couldn't understand. We had manual deployments, which to me in this day and age is shocking, but they were still manually deploying, so it was literally an ex-copy deploy. Uh, there was no continuous integration whatsoever. Again, I was completely shocked. Um, configuration drift was a real problem. So we had a lot of virtual machines where people are RDPing into the boxes, making configuration changes, deploying an application. So many different configurations between all of these different pieces of infrastructure, it was not funny. It was very, very hard to maintain. Um, a lot of the applications were very reliant on session state. So ticketing was a, a big one. It relied a lot on session state. So if somebody came through and basically left the browser, and then came back later, they couldn't continue that particular session. Um, and a lot of the load balance applications were using sticky sessions. So if you take a load balanced application and need to deploy it, you basically had to pull that entire box out, wait for an hour for the sessions to drain off, make a change, and then reattach it to the load balancer. Absolute nightmare. The other major thing was that we had, a, well, we do have, and we still have very, very large SQL databases. And when I say large, I'm talking hundreds of gigabytes in a single database on SQL Server. SQL Server will handle it, but it makes, again, you know, migrations and things like that an absolute pain. Which kind of brings me to the next thing. We had manual database migrations on a very large SQL box. So it's, it was a lot of fun. So we had a lot of things that needed to be fixed. Um, the other big, big indicator that something was wrong was that our testing, staging, and production environments were all different. All the way through, they were different. Other than that, our single biggest cost infrastructure with AWS and Microsoft licenses because when you have big SQL databases, they require big boxes with lots of CPUs. And SQL Server, these days, charges per virtual CPU. So when you're standing up massive boxes and you have a lot of them, it gets very expensive very, very quickly. Are you paying more for Amazon or more for... Uh, I pay more for the SQL licenses more than for anything. SQL than yeah. Amazon. Um, and we, we have a, a volume licensing agreement with Microsoft. To get, uh, to get the licenses, so we're not paying Amazon's licensing costs on top of ours. Uh, and, and it's still expensive. It, it's you know, more, our licensing costs for our software are more than our payroll. And we have a lot of staff, so go figure. Um, now, just to give you some quick background, now, our dev team, um, and this is all excluding me, we're geographically and internationally distributed. So we have people working in Indonesia, we have people in the Philippines, I have a guy in the States, I have another guy in Singapore. So geographic team, um, all of our communication is via Slack. So we very rarely speak in person. So it's interesting. Um, the .NET developers are all dark matter developers. Now, this is a term uh, that was coined by Scott Hanselman, and it's basically the guys that are happy doing the nine to five. They don't go home and do research. They don't look into the new technologies. They just keep doing what they do. They're pretty good at what they do, but they just don't have any interest in the new stuff. So they're not the guys that are going to user groups. They're just your regular nine to five. I come in, I do my job, I get it done well, and I go home. And why is it called dark matter? Because we never hear about them and we never see them. We know they exist, but we can't prove that they exist. <laughs> so there's a whole blog post about it. Um, and Scott Hansman talks about it a lot in his podcast. So it's a very interesting topic if you want to dig into that, just the whole culture behind dark matter developers. But it kind of gives you an indication, like they're really good .NET developers. You know, they, they, can, they can cut code. They know what they're doing. But when it comes to newer technologies, it's not something that they're going to get comfortable with. So it takes a bit of time to, to stand them up. And you need to bring them in to a new technology that's different on a nice, easy plane and give them the tooling support that they need. Um, we have two iOS developers on top of that, look after all the iOS stuff. Um, all of those guys, the iOS guys, are, are generally fairly happy playing with Unix-like systems. Now, why .NET developers moving towards Docker being on a Linux stack? have zero experience with Linux or Linux-like systems. So out of this entire team, I'm the only person that had any experience with maintaining and managing Linux systems. So it was fairly scary for a lot of them. 
Um, the other major thing with this particular team is they were very driven on, on GUIs. You know, they, they love their point and click development. So if I couldn't give them a really nice easy way to move towards Docker and this new kind of model, it was going to be difficult. So we had to make sure that everything was you know, nice and friendly for them. What, did you mean, what do you mean that they liked point and click? What, what thing? So when you think about the traditional Windows stack, if you need to go and set up a box traditionally in Windows, you'd put in a CD, you'd go through a point and click installer, click, 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 you get into that box, maybe RDP into it, so you've got a nice big GUI in your RDP in. Then you go and click around some more, make some configuration changes, go into IIS, there's a GUI there for you, you click around, make some more configuration changes. Very little is driven by a config file in the Windows land. In Linux land, everything is driven by a config file. It's either command line driven or it's config file driven. So the easiest way to explain it, like Windows is, is based off this registry model, right? So everything's API based. To make things easy for Windows developers and people that live in Windows land, Microsoft puts GUIs on top of things to make life a little bit nicer. That's starting to change with PowerShell, but it's going to take a while to get everybody up to speed on that because we've been doing this for the better part of 20 years, right? Point and click to set up Windows. That's how we do, that's, that's the Windows land. So things are slowly changing, but again, with my particular team, I needed to make sure that the point and click experience was friendly enough for them that they weren't going to be completely blown away by you know, the complexities and the other things that are brought in. So the stack that I started out with feels like a 2010 Barmer stack. So I remember before we had a, a quick conversation, and this is prior for everybody at home, a quick conversation about Steve Barmer basically saying that Linux is a cancer. Oh, okay. Well, things are starting to change. Now, the, the 2010 stack, it's great. It's solid. .NET 4 is great. You know, you can build applications and it'll live forever. But that doesn't excite me. And that's not what's going to bring on, that's not what's going to drive my business forward. I need to take some type of competitive advantage to lower my cost to make sure my competitors don't come in and blow me out of the water. So what I want is the 2016 Nadella stack. So Mr. Nadella keeps spotting out every couple of months and going, Microsoft now loves Linux. Cool for me. So where does that kind of bring me? Well, that brings me into the Docker space because I want to take these big monolithic applications and bring them into a more modern approach where things are driven by services rather than big monolithic applications. And Docker is a really good way to do that. I can take a very small application, package it up with all of its dependencies, and then deploy it. So mm -hmm. Docker being mm -hmm. Docker, requires a bit of reading. Now, I can't stress this enough. Don't be scared. There is so much information now. Docker 12 months ago would have been you know, d more difficult for, for Windows developers to get into. But today, it's a lot easier. So if you just go through the getting started with Docker, it'll give you a very good starting point. There's a great getting started with Docker on Windows 10 little video. It was put out by one of the MVPs. Um, it's only about 10 minutes, but it walks you through using the tooling the point and click experience. And also check out some of the uh, Pluralsight ASP.NET core fundamentals pieces because there's a lot of information at the moment around getting set up with .NET Core in Docker. So that just, just to cover the fundamental stuff. So I'm kind of making an assumption tonight that everybody has like, just a, a basic understanding of what a container is and has had some exposure to .NET Core, at least even just passing, just looking at it with File New Project or something similar. So Docker today, for Windows has a lot of tooling to get you ready. So there's a concept that comes out of the Toyota Lean movement called a pokey yoke. It was originally called baka yoke, and baka is Japanese for stupid. And the whole idea is to, uh, to idiot proof systems and processes. So Docker subscribes a lot to this pokey yoke idea. And they're creating tooling that's becoming more and more mature to help support us in our role as developers and DevOps and engineers and all the rest of it to get our applications into containers and then into production as quickly as possible. Now, the main kind of thing that you're going to be looking at from the Windows side of things is the Docker Toolbox. The Docker Toolbox is a nice little downloader. It will download and install VirtualBox, which will get you a nice little Linux VM, which is about 30 megabytes for the whole VM. Um, gives you Docker Engine, which is the actual engine, the runtime. Uh, Docker Compose to help you set up and run multi-container environments. 
Docker machine to help you set up different machines if you need them, and Docker Swarm is kind of the whole orchestration layer. Orchestration is an important point which we'll kind of come to later. The other thing that it gives you is an application called Kitomatic. And Kitomatic is the Docker GUI for Windows developers and OSX developers. It gives you a nice little interface for spinning up containers and dealing with different services. And it's something that I use a lot with my team to help smooth their path into using Docker. Now the other tools that we're going to really look at today are Docker Hub and Docker Cloud. Now Docker Hub is a way to take your container specification and basically build it automatically for you and host it. So what that allows you to do is then say, well, I've got this hosted container. I want to fire it off to a cloud provider and actually get it provisioned and installed. And that's where Docker Cloud comes in. So there's a lot of automation all the way through and a lot of tools in place to help you out. So you don't have to go and stand up all this infrastructure by yourself the first time around. So basically today we'll walk through some of, some of these things and how to do it and some of the gotchas that I ran into when I first started doing this. Uh, who releases these three tools? Docker. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Docker started life as a company called DotCloud. And DotCloud were a pass hosting solution. They were pr predominantly focused on PHP. Um, and they really took this whole container concept and made it their own by basically saying, look, every time somebody wants to stand up an application, it's going into its own container. Now, containers aren't a new thing. Google's been doing this for 10 years. Everything that Google runs is in a container. Everything. So containers today, at least on the Linux side of things, are a very mature technology. Very, very mature. 10 years in computing land is a long time, particularly at scale. So the first lesson that I really want to get across to everybody, use the Docker tooling. It's there to support you. Don't try and fight it. Read the documentation if you need to, but it is there. The documentation is really good. Really, really good. And most things, if you do run into problems, you can probably find a really nice, easy way to work around it with the good documentation that's available. Now, one other thing. If you're afraid of the command line, don't be afraid of the command line. At some point, we have to avoid or stop being point and click developers and actually dive into using command line tools because that's the way things are moving. Anybody that stood up a node application recently you'll know the pain of, of dealing with Node. Um, I spend a lot of my time on a Mac uh, dealing with iOS applications, so I have a lot of command line tools that I need to run just to get an iOS application up and running in Xcode of all things. Xcode is a nice little GUI, but all of the supporting infrastructure and frameworks that I need all have to be installed from the command line. And even just setting up you know, a basic CI box these days requires command line. There's no way around it anymore. We've got to get used to dealing with it. So this kind of brings us on to ASP.NET Core 1.0 on .NET Core. So ASP.NET Core, brand new framework, lots of rough edges, still technically RC. Um, it's probably really beta more than RC. But this was, this was basically the face I got from my boss when I suggested that we should start moving towards .NET Core. He was scared. He did not want to do it. My developers did not want to do it because it's brand new tech, it's, it's not all there. So .NET Core, and this is specifically you know, .NET Core CLR, lots of bad things about it. So it's still an RC, really it's, it's probably really beta. There's lots of breaking changes, so there are a lot of APIs that just don't exist that you're used to having in .NET framework. So really basic things like system.net.mail don't exist. So up until a month ago, we weren't sending email from our applications that were running on .NET Core. We were sending them from our legacy applications. I'd actually written services just to deal with sending email from traditional .NET on a Windows box because sending it from .NET Core was hard. You just couldn't do it. Um, that's kind of another thing too, and you'll hear this a lot. My favorite package X doesn't work with Y, or you know, it doesn't work with, with .NET Core. Because again, .NET Core, lots of breaking changes, APIs that don't exist. So in order to be cross-platform, Microsoft has basically taken a lot of the cryptography APIs out. There's a whole stack of new APIs that are coming in. They directly affect 99% of the NuGet packages that you probably use in your day-to-day -day job. So one of the big things for me, I had to step back and stop using so many packages. So a lot of the things that I have now, I've actually written ground up to be .NET Core compatible. Luckily, I haven't had to deal with too many of them. 
Now, the good side of it, it is a ground up rewrite, which means I don't have the 10 years of technical debt that comes with the .NET framework. So even if you spin up .NET Framework 4.6, you can still use deprecated framework features that have been deprecated since .NET 1.0. So you can still send mail from system.web.mail. That API was deprecated in 1.1, so that's 10 years ago. But you can still send mail from that deprecated API in .NET 4.6. Um, the other really nice thing is it is cross-platform, which for me is kind of the key business case because I want to reduce my licensing costs. I don't want to deal with Microsoft servers if I don't have to. I don't want to deal with SQL Server if I don't have to. So the whole concept here is to try and get as many of our Windows boxes away and have more of our services sitting on Linux, but still maintain .NET. So the main thing for me is I really like C Sharp. I think it's a great language. And I like the .NET framework. I think it's really powerful. And when I look at the alternatives, I'm still quite happy to be in the .NET space. Golang's cool, Python's cool, Java's, Java's enterprise, it's cool, but it doesn't excite me. It's not moving as fast as .NET. The other really cool thing about it is it is NuGet-based. So I only need to use the packages that I want to use. So I'm not bringing in a gigabyte worth of NuGet packages to do a basic little feature. I use the bare minimum that I need to get the job done, which means I get to come away with really small containers and small, con uh, small deployments. And that's the big thing too. It is container and Docker friendly. So as I said, everything is kind of broken, right? It's broken and it's in a constant state of flux. But don't worry, I'm cool with that. A lot of people might need, but in my case, it's, it's fine. It took a bit of arguing, but I got it through. So about running containers? Well, Microsoft is actually doing a lot of the legwork for you. So in the Docker space, you have what's called a base image. And a base image is where you build your services and everything on top of. So Docker in itself will have a base image and then a number of other images layered on top of it. And each layer brings in a special like little piece of functionality. So Microsoft gives you nice base images to start with. So in Linux land, they give you uh, Core CLR, which is the brand new runtime, plus Mono. If you wanted to take a traditional .NET application, bring it into a container, you can do that with Mono with some rough edges. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I did try it initially with some of our larger applications. Decided it was a really bad idea um, for my particular case anyway. But you may have smaller applications that do require particular functionality that's part of the full framework and you don't want to rewrite it. Give it a crack and running in core, oh, sorry, in, uh, in mono. You may be surprised. You may be able to get away with it. Um, the Docker file, which we'll cover in a minute, is actually hosted on, on um, GitHub, so you can actually go in and see how Microsoft is building their base container. And as I said, you build your images on top of the base containers. So this is kind of a key thing, right, when you're dealing with Docker. You can go in and build your containers interactively, which is you know, one way of doing it, and that's how I started out doing things. I just wanted to play with it, so I went in and spun up a container, and I built my image kind of line by line. I basically shelled into the container and went, I want to install this, then I want to install that, and I want to install this particular feature, exit out of the shell, and then I basically do what they call commit. So it's fairly similar to a Git flow. You commit into your repository and then you push. So I created my first lot of containers, which some of them we still use in production, unfortunately, um, by doing that. So shelling into an image, changing some configurations, and then pushing it up. Really not a great idea. The better way to do it is with the Docker file. So a Docker file is really simple. And this is kind of the default Docker file that you'll see. So to walk you through it, the first line at the top tells Docker to use the Microsoft base image. So in this case, I want to use Microsoft's ASP.NET 1.0 RC1. So that's the .NET Core stuff. Update 1, which is the latest and greatest that they've publicly released. That's not a beta bit. It's an RC bit with core CLR. So I can make the same container with mono, just change it from hyphen core CLR to hyphen mono. The next line, copy, tells it to copy a particular directory from my file system, so my local Windows machine, into the Docker container running on a virtual machine. Then work directory is basically CD, so change directory into the work directory. So I want to move into the slash app directory that I've just copied over. And then I'm going to run a set of commands. So in this case, we're running DNU restore. So DNU is the .NET utility, and it's the way that you restore NuGet packages with Core CLR. 
The next one down, expose, tells the image that I'm building to expose particular ports. So .NET uh, core applications with the new Kestrel web server, they expose everything on port 5000. So that's the port that I want to expose, is port 5000. The next thing down is the entry point. So when this container runs, what command should it actually run? So in this case, I actually want to run DNX was .NET executable with my particular project, and I want to run this command, which is the web command. So that's what a basic Docker file looks like. And that's the one you get out of the box by default if you basically go file new project, give me something with Docker. Uh, Visual Studio will give you this. Uh, there is also a set of command line tools if you're trying to do this on a Mac or a Linux box that will give you the same Docker file. So the tooling is there out of the box to get you this, to get you this far. And this is like the most simple kind of basic version of it. So there are a couple of best practice things that you need to follow. The main one is really around that run command. You don't, want to, you don't want to have too many run commands. Each run command builds its own image. So if you have stacks of run commands, like if you have 10 run commands, it'll build base image, another 10 images, and then another image for the very last one. So you end up with 12 or 13 images all stacked on top of each other. So you can end up having very, very large images because you've run all these different commands. The other thing is security. So being that it's a brand new, or we're moving to a different platform, all of my security credentials in Windows obviously aren't going to work. So I needed to do a lot of research around the best practice for security with Docker and Linux. So there is a lot of reading that is, that is required. Um, I will put all these slides up on SlideShare for everybody to get them so you can get all these leaks nice and easily. But they are things to be aware of. So let's actually take a look at what these containers look like and actually running them. So as I said before, you get Kitomatic as part of the Docker toolbox. Now, Kitomatic is a nice little point and click way of dealing with things. Now, you can see here I actually have some containers over here on the left hand side. These are actually instances of an image. Sorry? Uh, with this one, no. I don't have control of this application, sorry. Uh, with Kitomatic, actually, is there still a magnifier? There we go. Is that what you wanted? You happy? All right. <laughs> so with Kitomatic, um, you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have a set of containers. Containers are instances of an image. So if you think about it in OO kind of ideals, you have a base class, and that's your base image. And your base class may be inherited by other classes, Let's say these other inherited classes are our base, are, are the actual container image. Every time I create an instance of that object, I'm creating a container. That's the easiest way to think about it. And that's the way most people grok it, is that, that kind of OO ideal. Now you can see here I've actually got three containers. I've got uh, Docker Bork Bork, and that's just the name that I've given it. And the same with email demo and simple demo. So these are actually container instances that I've spun up previously. And they're all based on the actual container image that's underneath them. So there's uh, docker bork bork 0.01, docker.email demo 106, docker simple demo. So those are actually images that I've created. So if we were to actually go and run one of these containers, now I've got to work out how to get out of here. So this is actually spinning up at the moment. Um, it's a little bit slower than it normally is because we have some other software running on my machine to help record the screen. But eventually what we will see in here is actually the log of Kestrel, which is the Windows, uh, the ASP.NET server actually starting up. Now, this is actually going to fail and there's a, a reason for it. So at the moment we're still spinning up. Come on. There we go. So starting to spin up. So you can see here, this is actually you know, the container logs of that container spinning up. So it actually started up, and it's saying that it's available on port 5000. Now, this particular container, as I said, this will actually fail. It won't work properly. And there's a reason for that. And we're actually going to get into that. It's going to be our next lesson. So if I actually go to that particular container's URL, you can see here that it says error connection refused. Now this is the very first gotcha that I ran into when actually getting something to run in a container, at least with ASP.NET Core. Dunk. 
which kind of brings us to our next lesson. I'm oh, sorry, yep, that was our error. So something's not right, we're not happy. Brings us to our next lesson with Kestrel, which is our new way of running .NET applications. It's a new web server that's based on LibUV, which is the same kind of, uh, it's the same runtime that's used in Node for their, their web servers. We need to specify either server URLs or we need to create a hosting.json file. So with new .NET Core, and with ASP.NET Core, we have this idea of a project.json. So csproj has gone out the window and there's a new kind of way of doing things. In that project file, there's a set of commands and the main one that you get when you do a file new project is web. And that web command basically tells whatever runtime you're using to run Kestrel, which is the new web server based on libuv, to run Kestrel when you type web. So dnx, you know, run this project with the web command. So that's what the Docker container is running. So the first gotcha is that you need to specify that little part there in green. So you actually have to say that we're going to respond to these particular IP addresses on this server. So server URLs, HTTP, give me everything, port 5000. It took me 45 minutes to work that out. Much Googling, not Googling the right things. In Linux land, this stuff just works. Windows land, I'm going, why isn't this working? This is what the documentation says to do. And that's what the documentation actually had at the time that I was doing this stuff. It was literally just do this, do this, do this, hit run, and everything will work. And that was the official Microsoft documentation. Lots of blog posts later, I found out this is what needed to happen. There was a lot of different ways of doing this, but this is the one that I found to work most often. So if we go back to Kestrel, oh, sorry, Kitomatic. I'm going to spin up, I'm going to stop this container, and we're going to spin up Basically the same image, it's exactly the same, there's no changes other than changing that particular server URL. So you can see that one spun up quite quick. And now if we go to the web, oh, it's asking for something else. Just give me one second, see what's going on here. Ah, there's no port. One second. Can I close the windows? <sighs> so this is the fun of it. Wait patiently for things to spin up. And it's always when you're doing a demo that it takes that much longer. So my normal day today machine is quite beefy. It's you know, 32 gigabytes of RAM, eight cores. So these things are very, very fast. Uh, let me just click. Try again. Oh. We'll spin up one that I know does work. So we will show you. So just to show you exactly what I'm talking about with that project file. Oh, small. All right. So this is a project file from one of the applications that we're actually going to run tonight. So you can see here that there is this commands web ASP.NET Kestrel with the port 5000 on it. I'll just make that a bit bigger so everybody can see it. And that was one of the first things. So anytime I deploy one of these images or one of these applications, we've always got that in there by default now. And that actually, it's, it's one of the things I have a set of unit tests that actually tests for this now to make sure that that's in there. Because occasionally, some of my team will delete things just for the sake of testing and then they'll forget that they've deleted them, check them into the code base, goes up to my CI server and everything breaks. So I actually do test for that now. So if we go back, all right, so our email demo should be running. Oh, sorry. Oh, there's our simple demo. So anyway, this is the, the stock standard file new project for ASP.NET VNX. So this is actually running in a container. So 
this IP address here is the IP address of a Linux virtual machine that's running in VirtualBox on this particular little machine here. As I said, it's a very, very small VM. It's only about 30 megabytes. Has very, very little resources. The biggest thing that's actually attached to that VM now is this container image. The default file new project is about 1.8 gigabytes once you get everything down. Yeah. Okay, so we that container's running, so we can move on. So, lesson number four. As I said earlier, not everything is present in .NET Core. So things like system.net, uh, system.net not mail. Um, another thing that's, that's big on the list is reflection. A lot of people rely on reflection for a lot of different use cases. Reflection as a feature doesn't exist in .NET Core to the full extent that we're used to. You just don't need it. If you're relying on it, there's probably something wrong. Reflection tends to indicate a code smell at some point, particularly if you're doing multiple levels of reflection to get to a particular property. There are better ways of doing things. So up until February, sending email was very, very painful. But luckily, the community has come to our rescue. And there is a thing called MailKit. MailKit is built on top of a project called MimeKit. MimeKit is cross-platform .NET mail. And it's actually really, really powerful. It, takes, it makes system.net.mail namespace look like a children's toy. It is really, really powerful. So we send all of our email now using MailKit. And the next sort of containers, or the actual demo that I'm going to be using for the most part of tonight, is one that sends mail from a .NET core container. Because as I said, it was a really hard thing to get right. Sending mail is unbelievably hard. If you've ever looked into the RFCs for mail and MIME types, they are pages upon pages of crap. They are nasty things to deal with. MimeKit and MailKit, by the way, work in all versions of .NET. So basically .NET 4 all the way up. So it's something that you can use today without having to be on top of .NET Core. So let's go back to kit -to -matic. So we've got our email container running. So this is actually running again in the container. You can see down the bottom here, it actually has the machine name. So I'll make it really, really big. So the machine name, for everybody that can see, is basically very, very convoluted. Again, it's running in a virtual machine, so this is a dynamic machine. Dynamic container, they get dynamic names. Now, one of the things that we'll show later is how to basically load balance these containers using Docker Cloud and HAProxy. So that's kind of one of the features we're going to look at a little bit later is when we load balance these things, how this stuff works. Now, I can actually send mail from this. It does work. Uh, but just to, for brevity, we'll bang in some crap and hit submit. It'll whinge. But it does, does work. And this is a full ASP.NET 5 application. All right, cool. So, moving along. So, one of uh, the, the key things that, I, that I'm really worried about all the time, particularly having a distributed team, are uh, my very, very sensitive keys getting checked into source control and potentially pushed to a public code hosting repository like GitHub. Now, my organization does use GitHub, and we have public and private repositories. Uh, we also use Bitbucket, and we also use VSDS. So we have you know, repositories all over the place, depending on what the project is and what the use case for it is. Now, we've all seen these types of stories before. Somebody you know, basically forgets that they've got their key in a config file, checks in that config file, ends up on GitHub. Oops, my AWS account just got vaporized. Uh, I've actually seen it happen three or four times. I've seen it happen with Google Compute Engine. I've seen it happen with Azure. And I've also seen it happen with AWS. Um, it's always funny when it happens because you get to point at someone and go, I told you not to do that. But at the same time, you know, somebody's probably going to lose their job over it. Worst case scenario. They get access to your keys, which means they have access to your infrastructure, 
which means they can potentially have access to sensitive data. In my line of work, uh, with my current organisation, we collect a lot of very sensitive information about people. And if somebody was to actually get into my system, in some places, that would be a very, very troublesome thing. So, lesson number five. Environment variables are your friends. Now, traditionally in .NET land, we don't use environment variables, do we? How many of you actually have environment variables in any of your deployments? It's almost always in a web config transform or some type of config transform, and we're probably relying on something like Octopus Deploy to do the transforms for us. Linux land, environment variables are the kind of go-to. We don't have config transforms for the most part. So what I actually have set up in that send email demo is my send grid password. Now, I obviously do not want to check that into source control, do I? Because I've got this particular Docker demo up on GitHub. If I checked in my send grid password, guess what? My send grid account gets vaporized. I can't send email anymore. And there's a very good chance that, you know, for the large amount of email that I send from my day job, that they might get flagged too, because, you know, it's all coming from the same IP address for the most part. So I need to set environment variables for the containers. And ASP.NET Core actually supports this out of the box. So this is like a, an actual supported feature in the framework. The problem is the naming structure for these things uses colons. So you can see there it's SMTP settings, colon, password. That actually causes problems for me. So the way that I get around this is I change that name to have an underscore in it. So it's not ideal. It means there's a few, uh, few features that I can't use in .NET Core, but it gets around a particular problem that I have in my environment. Which, have I deleted it? Oh, there it is. I just skipped over it, sorry. So in my particular environment, I use Docker Cloud for provisioning and deployments and orchestration. And unfortunately, Docker Cloud doesn't support that particular naming convention. So as I said, to get around that, I actually have to remove the colon and use a different key. So basically, that's what my app settings looks like. So I have a set of uh, SMTP settings. So traditionally, this would be your system.net.mail XML config node. Everything in .NET Core is more towards JSON configuration. So it's all file-based JSON configuration or environment variables. So what I do is I specify the things that I'm happy with being in the public space. So I you know, send grids host. Everybody knows that. It's available publicly. My username, I'm not really that worried about. If somebody brutes it, they brute it. I don't care. Um, the port, and then the SMT settings, or the password, I leave blank. So basically what that forces my application to do is get that particular thing from uh, the environment variables. So I have a little method for sending an email, and you know, basically one of the very first things I check is whether or not I have a value for that. So if it doesn't, if it's not there, I'm just going to throw an exception and move on. At least I can handle that. So again, this is something that I can test for. I can actually create integration tests to make sure that when I spin up a container, all the right settings are there. If they're not, test fail, container doesn't get deployed. It's not particularly pretty code, but it gets the job done. So lesson six, distributed systems, you log everything and you monitor everything, even more so in Docker containers. Particularly when you're on a new platform or you're using a platform you're not intimately familiar with. So again, I log everything, I monitor everything at all levels. Now, my kind of uh, logging framework of choice is Siri log. So again, this is a Nick Bloomhart um, framework. And it actually supports Microsoft's new, because Microsoft, again, with a new framework breaks everything. They have a new set of logging frameworks around ASP.NET Core, and that's called Microsoft Extensions.logging. Siri log supports this today, as does Seek, which is the reporting kind of front end around Siri log. Um, I use that quite extensively. So I log everything from when the application starts to basically every method call all the way through. So I have very, very detailed analytics on how my applications are performing at any point in time. There is some overhead with using that much logging, but for the types of systems that I have to write with the high availability requirements, I need that logging in place. Because the minute something goes wrong, I need to be able to track it down quickly so I can triage and move on. Now, there is one really big gotcha that I ran into early. I was logging everything to file. So traditionally in Microsoft space, we go, cool, set up a logging, or maybe n, uh, is it log for net or uh, nlog or something similar. 
maybe even Alma, and log it all to file. And I'll come in and check those logs once every month or something. You know, or when there's an error, I'll RDP into the box. So we started trying to take a similar approach with Docker containers. The Docker containers have a thing called a volume where you can attach you know, external file resources to the container and log that way. What we found though was with the amount of traffic that we were pushing, that we would fill up boxes very, very quickly. And even with S3 and having scale and all the rest of it, you end up with a terabyte worth of log files very, very quickly. So what we tend to do now is send all of our logs to an actual proper log server. So in this case, we use Siri log for our .NET applications. And then on the APM and the analytics side, we use New Relic. Um, and I'm actually investigating a thing called Prometheus, which is a uh, Golang kind of self-hosted analytics and APM solution. It's kind of built out specifically for dealing with Docker containers and Linux environments. So which kind of brings me to lesson seven. Treat your containers as being immutable. Now everybody will start, well, everybody's heard the phrase immutable infrastructure. Anybody, does that sound familiar to everyone? Yep. What about the phrase, treat your servers like cattle, not pets? Yep. So one of the big areas that I have to deal with or wanted to really get away from is configuration drift. So we instigated a policy of you stand up a container, you never touch it again. So anytime you want to make a change that's a brand new container, that container gets deployed. So we treat our containers as 100% immutable and that goes right down to the container file system. You cannot change anything that's not going through a CI build process. Everything goes through CI, everything goes through testing, everything goes through integration testing, and then it gets deployed and orchestrated. So, as I said, you know, it's, it's kind of like a change management thing. You know, anything that's a change to an architecture, a feature, an API, configuration, dependency, linking to other services, all of that stuff needs to go through the build, test, deploy pipeline. I don't want any of my devs RDPing into, or SSHing into boxes and making changes. Everything goes through the testing pipeline now. Which kind of brings us to our uh, build test deploy pipeline. Now, as I said earlier, the whole kind of concept for me at the moment is I want to have all of my environments look similar, as, as close as possible. So my development environment looks almost identical to my production or my staging environment, which looks almost identical to my production environment. There are obviously differences, um, some being the size of those services. So in my testing environment, our databases are small. I don't want to stand up multi-gigabyte databases for testing. And in my staging and testing environments, my databases are actually in containers. They're not standalone services like they are in production. But I want to replicate as close as possible the arrangement of those services. So, you know, all of our applications today, generally, if, you, if you're, you know, it's 2016, everything's a distributed system. Everything's relying on multiple services at some point. So, we want to, as I said, try to replicate that as much as possible. So, in this particular case, all my devs are on Windows 10. Um, we're packaging our applications into containers. And our biggest thing, you know, our biggest difference between dev, testing, staging is really only the, the arrangement, or sorry, the size of the services and the configuration environments. So, you know, connection strings, environment variables. And this is kind of like really a key point. I think, quite personally, immutable infrastructure starts with consistent development environments. So in your environments today, does your development machine look different to your partners sitting next to you? Yep. What about yours? Different environments? Either of you guys? Yep. So almost everything you do is going to be different, right? Yeah. In my environment today, you know, everybody's got their own kind of Windows set up. That's cool, everybody's got their own preferences for Visual Studio, that's cool. But when you go to run our applications and actually do proper dev work on them, they get stood up in containers. And the way we do that is we use the thing called Docker Compose. Now, docker-compose.yaml YML, is a way to specify the arrangement of those services. So think of it this way, right? A Docker container will host an application. Cool. That container might need you know, two or three other containers to form a full service. So what Docker Compose allows you to do is to specify entire kind of stacks or infrastructures. Now, when you t move from the Docker Compose side, which is kind of your development environment, into something like Docker Cloud, where you need to be able to deploy things, the terminology changes somewhat. It goes from being Docker Compose to stack files. Very, very similar though. 
So it's a YAML base, so yet another markup language based format. Um, it allows you, as I said, to specify multi-container systems and applications. Really, really useful for development environments. That's how we do everything today. It's all in that kind of Docker Compose workflow. Key thing is though, you do not use Docker Compose in production. If you go through any of the Docker documentation, it makes it very plain and clear that it's not ready for production. Use it in your dev and your testing environment, cool. In production, you move to something like Docker Swarm or in our case, we use Docker Cloud. Now, stack files, when you're moving towards Docker Cloud, they change the name a little bit. So instead of it just being you know, stackfile.yaml, they want to have docker-cloud. So it allows you to basically check in and version your, uh, your infrastructure. And it gives you ways to, to track changes over time as well. <coughs> so this is what a very, very basic uh, Docker Compose file looks like. So in this case, we have basically two images that I need to worry about that form my service. So I have a load balancer. So over there, there's services. LB is load balancer, so that's the name of this particular service that I want to worry about. And then I'm telling it that I want to use a particular image. So images are available on Docker Hub, so there's a lot of publicly available things pre-built to help you get started. And for the most part, I haven't had to worry too much about building my own containers other than for my own applications. So infrastructure pieces like load balancing or databases, I generally rely on the publicly available stuff. Now the next line down after the image is linked. So that basically says to it, this service you need to link to a different service and you're going to act as a kind of go-between. So I want my load balancer to load balance my services. Pretty straightforward, right? That's human readable. It's not too hard. The next line down is the port, so 80 to 80. So I want port 80 from my virtual machine to be mapped to port 80 on my container. Containers, believe it or not, have their own networking. So if you have a port exposed on a container, that doesn't necessarily mean that port is exposed to the world. You actually have to tell it up front that you need that container exposed. So that's what we're doing there. We're saying ports 80 to 80, you're exposed port 80 for port 8 in the container. The next one down is uh, the email web. So that is my little... Send an email demo. Sorry. sorry. You're right. <coughs> Do you know where Adam is? Uh, he's probably downstairs. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So what I'm actually specifying here is I'm telling it that I want to build a Docker image based on my application off my file system. So I'm always building the latest Docker image for my particular application at a given time. So my dev environment basically looks like this. So my developers make a stage of changes. They might F5 and test those particular changes without integrated services. Then they go, Docker Compose up, and it builds the container for them, and it stands up all the infrastructure, and they can actually test against a virtualized version of our production infrastructure. Then the other thing I'm doing there again is we're, I'm exposing port 5000. Now that's, that's like a very basic Docker Compose file. Um, we have some very complicated ones that have multiple services, so there might be a Redis cache in there somewhere for session state. Um, the most complicated one that I have has um, load balancer, web front end, load balancer, application servers, or API servers, um, session state servers, which are load balanced, um, and then a stack of databases, which are also load balanced. So they get very big very quickly. Um, we tend to run that on a very beefy integration box. Now, this is what the stack file actually looks like for that same application. Now, again, it's, it's fairly similar, so I still have the same services, the email web and the load balancer. In this case, though, I'm using an image that I've actually built on my machine, pushed to the Docker Hub. So it pulls the image directly from Docker Hub. And it's actually telling it what to do with the provisioning and everything. So if I make a change, I want it to get redeployed automatically. I want it to deploy into a high availability cluster, so I get automatic failover and all that type of stuff. I pass in my environment settings in this. So this gets stored in Docker Cloud. This doesn't get uh, committed into <coughs> my particular GitHub repository. Um, if something falls over, then I want it to restart automatically. Sequential deployment basically allows me to have that high availability. So I want to deploy, you know, if I've got, in this case, I'm telling it, I want to have it always have two containers. So I'll do one container deployment first, wait for that to come up, and then I'll do the next container deployment. So I've always got something there. 
And then again, the load balancer. So in this case, I'm using uh, HA proxy to load balance my containers. So kind of brings us into the next thing, which is our continuous integration discussion. Now this internally for me was a very, very decisive, uh, divisive topic. I wanted to have a full on proper, you know, you know, team city into this box here, which builds up all the images and runs all the integration tests and does all these lovely things and then moves on to the next thing and then moves on to the next thing. It was, you know, a full on proper testing environment. So build, oh, sorry, continuous integration, build, containerize, <coughs> deploy, testing, staging, the whole thing. I wanted to do that from the get go. But I don't get everything that I want all the time. <coughs> so this kind of comes down to like, there's so many different options for these things. So, you know, one, one particular option, or one way you can do is basically from your source control into continuous integration of some type. So that can be, you know, TeamCity or Jenkins or CircleCI or pick your flavor of continuous integration, which builds your container for you and does all your stuff and then flips that over to Docker Hub and Docker Hub knows what to do with it there and they basically publish the thing, everything for you and that notifies Docker Cloud and then Docker Cloud does something. Cool, that's one way. Or you can go a very simplistic way and just go straight from your source control, check into GitHub or Bitbucket, straight into Docker Hub, Docker Hub builds the image for you, tags it, does all that lovely stuff and then ships it over to Docker Cloud, Docker Cloud does the deployment for you. <coughs> or if you end up having a very large container deployment, then you start looking at you know, a proper integration. So you go from your source control into integration, into a private registry. Private registries are a, a feature of Docker. Essentially, you can stand up your own private registry on your own hardware, which allows you to have your own images you know, in your own firewall, basically, outside of your DMZ. Into some type of orchestration, um, and then you know, either into cloud or your on-prem environment. So many ways of doing this. And essentially, it, just pick one that works for you. It, it's really, it, every time I've done this, or every time I've had a, a container-like environment, it's been different. So the, the largest environment where I had containers, we had thousands and thousands of them. And the way that you got a container into, deploy, into production was that you sent a very large job request it was all automated, of course, but there was a job request and you had to specify services and that job might get scheduled on, you know, one, two, N processes across a massive distributed network. Exceedingly different to what I currently do. Kind of the key thing though is when, when you do go down that traditional route of having proper CI and everything else, you're going to need a Linux box. This is one of the key things. You can't build a container today <coughs> to run on Linux on Windows. You actually have to have a Linux box to do that properly. So even when I build containers on this machine or on my day-to-day -day dev machine, they're actually being built in a Linux VM in VirtualBox. So you will need a Linux machine at some point to do the Linux container story. So kind of brings me to another question. What about Visual Studio 2015 tools for Docker? Has anybody seen or heard about this? It's actually an extension. You can download it and install it into Visual Studio 2015 and it gives you basically what amounts to web deploy <coughs> for Docker containers. So it'll give you a Docker file. It will basically give you a UI to publish to Azure in a Linux environment or on Windows Server. Really, really good for single container applications. Really good for one-man shops. It's not great for anything that even looks like a proper application. So I use it a little bit when I'm playing with Windows Server containers because I just couldn't be bothered setting up a full CI environment for it. Um, <coughs> but it's really just not suitable for any real production work. So as I said, like my CI environment, the way that I wanted it was you know, massively different to what I got first time around. So my 1.0 setup essentially for our source control, uh, source control build deploy was, was f fairly simplistic. 
So we have you know, a, a fairly simplistic Git flow where our master branch is always deployable for all applications. So we have our feature branches getting merged into a development branch. Development branch is what kind of gets worked on day to day. Once we're happy with that, it gets merged into master and it gets tagged with a release. So it's, it's fairly simplistic uh, Git flow workflow. Um, it's not particularly the way I'd like it, but it is what it is. From there, um, it gets pushed into a GitHub private repository. And we have an integration with our Docker Hub account. So Docker Hub basically pulls down the latest on master and any tags that are on master and builds two Docker images. So it'll build a latest Docker image and a tag Docker image. So we'll have you know 1.0.20 or 1.1.20 or whatever our version is at that point in time, plus a latest tag. From there, Docker Cloud does all the hard work for us. It takes our images and basically builds out our infrastructure based on our stack files and produces two sets of infrastructure for us. It produces a uh, testing and a staging. Once we're happy with those, we actually do a manual button click deployment to production. So that was our, our 1.0. So that lasted for about two months. And, and for the most part, we were, we were pretty happy with that. Um, when we started to, to move into larger deployments of things, we started to try and automate things a little bit more. Which kind of brings us into my, my 1.0.1 setup. Now, <clears throat> this is where I'm starting to get closer to what, I, to what I wanted in the first place. So I still have my Git flow, very simplistic, um, not overly complicated, but then I move into a proper Jenkins CI server. So I've got Jenkins set up to build .NET core applications on Linux. Um, it actually does a build and a publish, so I get a very small set of files. I execute all the unit tests, execute any integration tests I have on that particular application. It then actually builds tagged instances or tagged images. We tag with a build number and a branch and all the information that's relevant to that particular feature branch or that particular branch within our tag hierarchy. Sorry, our Git hierarchy. Um, we build. Uh, we do a, an automatic integration as well, or automatic merge, make sure everything is fine there. And we build a master and we tag that as latest. And then we push it to a private Docker Hub repository. So Docker Hub has this notion of public and private repositories. So in our, um, in our previous step, sorry, there is also a, a private Docker Hub repository in there. <coughs> and then from there, we're still using Docker Cloud to do our, our orchestration deployment story for us. But it's getting closer to what I want. Now, the key thing here, um, when I set all this up, I was trying to be a little bit cheeky. And I actually set up Jenkins in a container just for the sake of it. So what I can actually do now is set up or deploy multiple Jenkins instances based on my container image. So if I need to build something very, very quickly, and I need to you know, have X number of unit tests or things going on, I just spin up new Jenkins instances, new containers, and it just pulls everything down and fires it off. It's great fun. So which kind of brings me to, to lesson nine. Make sure you tag your containers. So Docker has this concept of a, of a namespace. So it's basically you know, your organization name slash your <coughs> container image name, colon, and then a tag. So you can have you know, latest, you can have semver, you can have you know, whatever you want. Um, we tend to use uh, latest uh, build number branch, and then we have our semver tagging as well. So, when you actually ship things off to Docker Hub, if you follow kind of like the tagging ideal, you'll get nice little kind of builds and tags and everything going on. So we'll actually jump across and take a look at that. So this is my little personal Docker Hub which has almost nothing in it, apart from our little Docker demo that we're working with tonight. Oh, too far. There we go. All right. So if we go in here, we can actually take a look at the Docker file that I have for this particular, particular application. 
So it's very close to the, the one that I showed you before. So the only major differences here is I've added a maintainer tag and a label, and we have two run arguments, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. And then we can actually see in here that there have been different builds going on. So with this particular setup, I make a change in my local Git repository and I push it to GitHub. Uh, Docker Hub then knows about that GitHub repository, pulls it down and does a build. So just to give you a, a quick demonstration of, of how that would work, we'll just make a small change in Uh, where are we? Docker file. So I've just added change to the Docker file. I will commit that. Tag it as 107. Uh, and I'll push it to GitHub with the tag. Now, it'll take a little bit, but we should be able to see shortly, there we go, that All of the build tools, they come from the Microsoft base image? So the DNU, all that type of stuff, yep, it's all part of the base image. Yep. So the base Im Microsoft base image ships with the full uh, .NET core runtime, which includes .NET utility, .NET executable, um, and the .NET version manager. Do you ever run tests? So, what, yeah, so one of the things I do, um, I have some images that are layered. So I'll have the application image, the actual base application, and then I'll have a testing image layered on top of that. And it's particularly useful for, um, for things like JavaScript testing. So I, um, I'm not a fan of JavaScript because I, I come from a server-side world where everything for me is easy to test. Uh, but a lot of our modern applications are very JavaScript heavy. Um, and I just don't have the, the same confidence about the JavaScript that I write as I do with the C Sharp and my you know, traditional server-side languages. So I write a lot more tests. So I'm just not that confident about it. So I build my base image. I then layer my application on top of that. And then I layer a set of Karma unit test images on top of those. So I know that you know, I can go build, build, these are all happy. All right, what about testing? Well, we need to run this set of JavaScript tests, or I need to run this set of unit tests and integration tests. So I can actually spin up different containers with different testing environments laid on top. So that's one way of doing it. And you can actually specify different run, and, um, yeah, different run events and different entry points for each level of those containers. So like, I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick idea. We'll just jump over to the GitHub. Uh, Show you a quick way of doing this. Uh, GitHub, GitHub, GitHub. So what I'm actually looking for at the moment is the Microsoft bits. Cool. Yeah. All right. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm going to ASP.NET GitHub page, and I'm actually going to go to the Docker file for the base image. So in this particular Docker file, so this is the one that I'm using as the base image for my application tonight. And it's the one that I use for the base image for most of my applications that I have in production. So it's saying here that it's using Debian. So Debian is basically, it's one of the base images for Ubuntu, essentially. So Ubuntu is built on top of Debian. Um, they set a stack of environment variables, so the .NET version, you know, where it is. They have to do a stack of really, really funky stuff to make sure that uh, SQLite works. Um, they download the latest version, or they download the version of .NET that they want and install it. So you can see here that there's a run command, so run bash c source boom boom boom. This is actually installing .NET itself into that image. And then it installs libuv for the Kestrel web server. And you can see here there's all these different run statements. So there's a run statement there. And then it sets an environment path as well. 
So when I build my containers, my images, these run events still happen. So every time I build a container, one of these things will run. So what you can do is actually layer these things. So in, um, in more modern or more um, <coughs> just refresh that. More mature environments, sorry. In more mature environments, uh, they'll have you know base image and then a security image and then application image and then maybe logging and then maybe testing and then they just keep layering the images as you get higher. So different aspects of your application stack go into different images and then you layer those on top. So it's like, think of it as like Lego blocks. That's the easiest way I can explain it. You have like a Lego block. You have your base plate, right? And then you're stacking extra little pieces of Lego on top of that base plate to build a house. Same deal with Docker. In each one of those images, you can run individually. Mm -hmm. And the base one, it said Debian there. That's a whole operating system, right? right. It's no, it's, 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 it's a small, it's a cut down version of just the kernel for that image. <coughs> so you can get, no, yeah, so, uh, so you can have, basically, so the way that they build the images out. The Debian base image um, is actually really small. It's only you know, 200 meg. So it'll be um, the pieces on top of the Linux kernel that it needs to, to make it Debian, um, plus maybe like app get, but it won't have any of the updated sources. So one of the things you see when, with most Linux images is the very first thing they run is like all the packages get updated, and then they do the installs, and then they do a cleanup. So there are so many container options. You don't have to use the Microsoft base container. It's just there to help you out. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking at in the future is basically taking very, very small like core OS image, which is almost nothingness, and then trying to build ASP.NET on top of that. So basically, I want to get my images down from like the smallest one I have at the moment is 700 meg. And that, that's the full container image deployed. I want to get that down to 150, 200 meg. I want to have it so tiny that I can deploy it in under a second. That's kind of my end goal anyway. I'm not quite there yet. But um, as, I, as I was saying before, you know, tagging your, your branches and things like that is really important. It gives you some very nice tooling support in Docker Hub and also in Docker Cloud. Cool. So let me just jump back to where we're at. It kind of brings us on to our deployment point. So we're not too far away from being finished, guys. So I'm sorry I've kept you so long. Docker Cloud is a really great starting point for anybody that's coming into this set of technologies because it gives you a full set of tooling and almost a pass solution that is cloud agnostic. So you can take Docker containers built for Linux and deploy them to Azure. I deploy all my stuff to AWS for the most part, but I don't want to be beholden to AWS. If AWS goes down, I want to be able to take my entire infrastructure and deploy it to, AWS, uh, to Azure in you know, half an hour. The only thing I've really got to worry about is a big, massive SQL database. But I've got that mirrored across multiple data centers and multiple cloud providers at the moment. So that's the least of my concerns. But the rest of my infrastructure, I can stand up on Azure fairly quickly. Um, it is really, really easy for .NET devs to wrap their heads around. It's very similar to, to Azure or AWS or any of the other cloud services that we're used to using. It does give you nice point and click kind of setups for things. Nice little draggers. If you need to scale something up, it's a drag deploy. It's really nice. So I'll actually just um, jump into that, take a quick look. So <clears throat> as I was saying before, the, the terminology changes a little bit when you get into Docker Cloud. So they have this concept of a stack, which is very similar to our Docker Compose. So I have here the email demo stack, and that's very similar to the one that I showed you before. The only difference here is I've probably tweaked a version or two. Um, stacks are composed of services. So you can see here that I've got our email web image, and that's running in four different containers. And I've got my load balancer running in two containers. Now, what's the, the key difference between kind of this setup and what I had before? is I actually have multiple nodes. So a node is essentially a virtual machine. In this case, they're virtual machines running in AWS. So you can see here, I have two virtual machines. They're running in AP Southeast BNC. 
So they're two of the three availability groups here in Sydney for AWS. To set these up, I literally clicked launch new node cluster and told it how many nodes I wanted and what size. When those spun up, I then told it what stack I wanted. And it went and provisioned and did everything for me. So what it's actually got running on here will be one load balancer and two containers, or one, one load balancer container and two web containers. So you can see there it's got load balancer two and email web two and four. And if I went to the other one, it would have load balancer one and uh, web one and three. So it's smart enough, Docker Cloud is smart enough to do all the orchestration for you so you don't have to worry about it. This is why I'm saying it's a really great starting point. When you start getting to a little bit bigger, a bit more scale, you might want to start considering moving away from Docker Cloud and then into something more, uh, more enterprise grade, so maybe like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or something similar. Now, just to prove to you that this stuff actually is live and working, I'm actually just going to go over to the services. I'm going to grab the load balancer. Now, each of these load balancers will actually have an endpoint. Actually, sorry, just quickly. So you can see there, as I was saying before, if I want to deploy more containers or more images, it's literally drag and click. It'll go and deploy them, and it'll, it'll deploy them to particular nodes based on the strategy that I've suggested. So in this case, I've told it that I want this particular stack to be high availability. So it'll work it out which node is going to be the best node to put it to based on <coughs> the, uh, the current usage of those nodes. Anyway, if I just go to the endpoint, so this is actually just a public endpoint out there in the interwebs. Now, it might take a little bit to spin up because the app has been sitting there cold. All the way for that, we'll keep digging through. Now, one of the nice things about this is that you can work off other people's other people you can work off other people's hard work to get your infrastructure up and ready. So you can see there that was my uh, last update. It was five minutes ago. So that's when it's worked out it's deployed the new application. But say I wanted to create a, a new new set of services. I can work off things called jump starts. So kind of like most common things that'll pop up, you know, things like MongoDB, Postgres, MariaDB, you know, your basic database services, caching, maybe monitoring solutions, New Relic, Datadog. Maybe you need a messaging bus. Um, so this is one of the things that I have a lot in my services. Everything is message driven. So we have a lot of RabbitMQ instances running around. And a lot of these things, we just jump in here, find what we need, click start, tell it how many we want, where it's going, the deployment strategy. You know, I want it on every box. I want it as part of a high availability cluster. I want it on the emptiest box. The number I want, any additional things, hit go, bam. Five minutes later, I've got a brand new service stood up, ready to go. So it's a really powerful tool. And as I said, it's a really great place to get started. Oh, OK, so now we're spun up. OK, so this is the, uh, the email demo from before. So you can see that it's email web 2. So when you deploy these things in production, they actually get proper names. So if you have, uh, and one, one of the things that I like to do when I deploy my applications, whatever machine you hit at any given time, you can tell it's always displaying the machine name down the bottom with the version of that particular piece of software. Hopefully it does have sticky sessions. There we go, so now we're on web three. So this will be using hopefully emptiest node or round robin. Come on four. There we go. So it is load balanced. I don't have to do any work to get that load balancing set up. I basically just told it that I needed HA proxy and to link it to this particular set of applications and off I went. 
So it, it is a very nice and quick and easy way to get things up and running. Um, very powerful for .NET devs when you don't want to dig through dealing with Linux configs. HAProxy is a, a Python load balancer. Um, another great popular one is Nginx. So some of my applications sit behind Nginx. We serve static files out of Nginx and then .NET applications out of other pieces. Oops, clicked on the wrong thing. Cool. So we're almost done, guys. So as I said, yeah, Docker Cloud is there to make your life easier. It is a really good starting point. Um, and the, and the, it is one of the things actually that, that helped me sell moving contain or moving to a containerized kind of landscape to management and to the other developers that I have to work with. So just a really quick quick word on orchestration. Orchestration is a really hot topic in Docker containers, and you'll see a lot of people will either love a particular set of orchestration technologies or completely hate it or just don't care. Now, the big one that always pops up is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the cool new tech, right? It's actually Google's third attempt at an orchestration framework. So um, I spend a lot of time working with Googlers and around Googlers in a lot of countries. And their framework was basically built all around this thing called Borg. <coughs> and Borg was built specifically around Google's you know, scale problem. Google's scale problem is we have all these CPUs and we don't know how to run enough stuff against them. So Borg was built specifically to deal with scheduling tasks and workloads on massive distributed infrastructure. Kubernetes is the third version of that. It takes its lineage from Borg and then another thing called Omega. Omega wasn't really fit for purpose, so we canned it. Kubernetes, again, is kind of built for Google's problem. So it's probably not the best solution for small business or you know, guys that are just starting out. But as you do get to scale, it is a very, very powerful framework. And it is one of the things that Google actually runs on top of Google Compute. So if you spin up containers and push them to Google Compute, you're running on top of Kubernetes. That is the orchestration framework there. Docker has its own uh, orchestration framework called Docker Swarm. And Docker Swarm is really powerful and it's very easy to use. Um, it's probably where I'm going to start heading in the next six months once I get past our kind of initial growth phase with Docker Cloud and we start running into cost there. Um, but today, we just use Docker Cloud for everything. We keep it simple. And that's kind of like my mantra with all this stuff is to keep it as simple as possible and just keep moving it forward. So just some uh, other deployment options, things to think about. Um, Amazon has a thing called Elastic Container Service which is kind of a task scheduling framework on top of EC2 that allows you to schedule different payloads in different containers. Um, it may be something that I look at down the track for my particular workloads, but at the moment I'm happy with the Docker Cloud story. Um, Azure has its own container service. Um, I haven't looked into it all that much. I know it's available, um, but it's just not, it's not where, I've, where I've focused my attention. The other thing though is, is Docker Container Engine. Um, as, as I said, I've had a lot of experience dealing with Googlers and being around their infrastructure for a long time. So it is something that I'll probably look at again to be multi-cloud within Australia, um, being that we do have a Google data center here in Sydney. The other option, of course, is to, to bring your own data center and to bring your own Linux boxes and to set up your own nodes. So just to recap, uh, kind of like the things that, I, that I've learned trying to port .NET applications and move things over to Docker. It's really important to use the Docker tooling. You know, don't fight the tooling, just, just let it do its job and it'll help you out. When you're building your own images, build them with a Docker file, don't SSH into the image or don't use the interactive terminal to go in and build out the files and do crazy things that way. Actually build them in a repeatable manner using Docker files. Uh, dealing with Kestrel, libuv, Make sure you specify server URLs or put in a hosting.json with the uh, HTTP star and the port number. Otherwise, you're going to run into some pain and you'll sit there scratching your head trying to work out why things aren't working. .NET Core, it's rough around the edges. So if you need to find, or you need a, a particular piece of functionality that's not there, use the community and try and find a package that solves your problem. Chances are somebody's already had the same problem and fixed it. Lesson five is environment variables are your friend. So again, in the Linux environment, environment variables are the done thing. Um, not a lot of configuration transforms. And we want to keep as many of our uh, secrets and our passwords out of configs as possible. Environment variables are a really good way of handling that. Lesson six, log everything, monitor everything. So I saved 
a lot of time by having good logging. It saved me so many troubles when troubleshooting, or so much pain troubleshooting, particularly with distributed applications and message passing. As I said, I log everything all the way through the stack and I monitor everything all the way through the stack. Lesson seven is treat containers as being immutable. So they really are cattle. You know, they may be short-lived cattle, but they are cattle. So my average container life cycle <coughs> for my production applications may be anything from five minutes to five days, but they do get killed. And they get killed quite often. They don't live that long. Uh, lesson eight, so you wanna use Docker Compose and Docker Stacks to define your systems so that you can have repeatable deployments and your dev testing and staging environments look as much like production as possible. Uh, lesson nine, version your container images with tags, whether it be Git tags or the actual Docker tag itself. It's a really powerful way of versioning your containers so that you have repeatable deployments and you can specify specifically which version of something is getting deployed at any given time. And the final lesson for tonight is Docker Cloud makes your life easy. It really is powerful, guys, and, and I cannot stress that enough. And um, if you're interested in any further reading, um, there is a really good list of curated Docker resources. It's called the Curated List of Docker Awesome. Um, it's veggiemonk.github.io, sorry, awesome-docker. And it's full of a lot of information. And then the other thing, if you're interested in, uh, in learning a little bit more about Kubernetes and where that came from, there was a uh, ACM paper that was published by some of the researchers at Google in the last week or so as part of the ACM. I strongly suggest you give, a, give that a read because that gives you a fairly good indication of what it's like running and maintaining containers at scale. Well, much appreciated. I, I really do appreciate the fact you guys spent your time tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, just to make sure I follow up to the correctly. So, can you speak to the minus that? Yeah, let's pull it out. So, you can take it out. It comes up. It comes up. Slide it out. There we go. Yes. Uh, so, each um, ASP Docker application. Uh, would have its own, uh, own container. Like one or multiple containers yep. associated with it, depending uh -huh. on the version. Yep. So the first version obviously goes with, with the first brand new image. Yep. So you write a pull request and then you merge it, and then the second change would be associated with a different with mm -hmm. a whole brand new yep. container. So with ev every time, at least in my infrastructure, the way I've got it set up, every single time I do a build that's a brand new container, has its own tag, its own version. So if I'm working in a feature branch, cool. I build out that feature branch as part of my CI. That gets built as its own container image. So I can actually test that container image based on that build. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Um, and my second question. Uh, so, so we deploy these uh, containers onto the deployment environment. So we have like heaps of, uh, you know, side by side. Deploy, deploy yeah, well so that's, that's one, of the, one of the kind of the things you can look at is doing um, red-green deployments, right? So in, the, in an immutable infrastructure world, you have a load balancer at the top, you have a set of you know, green containers, you have a set of blue containers. At the moment, green containers are the ones that are currently being served by the load balancer. I need to push a new set of changes. Well, I've got this set of containers over here that are currently marked as blue. They might be the version behind. Cool, I'll push onto those containers. So what I actually do is, Terminate those running instances of that container, push the new version, stand up new instances. Once they're all stood up and everything is green, I tell the load balancer, hey, start moving across to the blue kind of cluster. As that all comes online and everything's okay, I decommission the green cluster. So I do end up in some cases having two versions of the same lot of containers, or same, same, uh, same applications, but what that allows me to do is roll back if something happens. And it's the only way you can really, or it's not the only way, but it's the best way of dealing with rollbacks. So I have you know, one set of infrastructure running. That's the blue version. Blue version is currently serving production traffic. Cool. Push a new set of changes to green. Bring those all online. Run my tests. Everything's OK. Start pushing traffic across with the load balancer. Decommission blue. So I, I get you know, rolling deployments like that, which is quite nice. OK. My last question, um, in terms of the, the hosting um, scheme, 
how how different it is like in in Windows and Linux? Um, yeah, so th this is a kind of a, a trick question almost. In Windows land, we're so used to running everything in IIS. Yeah. So with .NET v Next or ASP.NET Core, whatever they're calling it today, everything basically, even if you're hosting an IIS, it's still running Kestrel. So we have a self-hosted model now where <coughs> everything's run as a process and then you load balance those processes. So the hosting model is very different and, and it's, it's a bit of a learning curve. But that's part of the reason why you know, this whole concept of Docker containers is quite nice because you can use tooling like the Docker Cloud to automate a lot of that stuff for you so you don't have to worry about it. But the, the whole concept is if you can run Kestrel on your machine with Core, chances are it's probably going to run in a very similar manner on a Linux machine in Core with the same lot of framework and the same application. So again, the whole idea, repeatable deployments as close to production as possible. I'm not relying on IIS configurations or I'm not reliant on you know, my dev team and my ops teams making sure everything is in alignment anymore. I control everything from the time that I build it. Any other questions? Nope. Time for a bit. When you have the <laughs> test containers, yep. you, you, you talk about how you have the layers. You literally just spin them up, they run their tests, and then they just come yeah, back down again? just kill them. Okay. So my, my testing infrastructure, my containers live for about three minutes. All right. <coughs> and you're saying, I don't know, this is probably more Docker related. You're saying the kernel is in the base, base, base image. Yeah, so. Like you're running a Linux instance, which is running Docker images. Linux it gets, it can get pretty meta. Yeah. yeah. Kernel, it gets, it can get pretty meta. So, um, do you remember the, uh, What's the guy's name? Exhibit. There's an exhibit means like, I heard you like this dog and then something, something, right? And it's always like the whole concept of a meta joke. What can happen is you can be running, you know, a Linux base, you know, like your, your container host. So that might be Ubuntu or Core, Core OS or something, right? But it's still got the Linux kernel there. What containers really do is they hypervise the kernel. So traditionally with hypervisors, we would basically try and virtualize the underlying hardware. So we'd take an entire OS and drop it on top of another entire OS. And that was the whole kind of virtual machine ideal. With containers, we go, well, we're going to take a higher step. Instead of virtualizing all of that container or all of the metal underneath and making it look like it's another machine, we're just going to virtualize the, VM, uh, the, the kernel. So I might have host operating system with Ubuntu, and it might be at 14.04. And I might have container one, which will be Coral OS. It'll have a you know, hypervised version, essentially, or you know, a virtualized version of the Core OS Linux kernel, plus some Core OS features. So I can, if I really wanted to, with a bit of fiddling, I can jailbreak out of that particular kernel in user land and jump into the kernel underneath. Um, it, again, it gets a bit meta, but you can end up actually having you know, kernels on top of kernels on top of kernels. Um, you want to try and avoid it where possible. So generally, you'd, you'd pick a base image and you'd use that same kind of base image across as much of your infrastructure as possible, just so you have something that's... So everything always has the same... Yeah, where, where, where possible. Um, but you know, in saying that, you now I pulled down a Postgres image. I don't know what the base image is underneath the Postgres image because I've just gone, I need Postgres. And I don't particularly care because I'm after that particular service. Um, and it's probably something that I should look into at some point. But it can get pretty meta. You can end up having kernels on top of kernels on top of kernels on top of kernels. Interesting. It's all, as with all technologies, there's pitfalls. And there's so many ways to shoot yourself in the foot if you really want to get into it. Because and again, it's, you know, any, any technology can be dangerous if you give it to the wrong person and let them go wild with it. It's like C. C is a great language. It's really, really simple until you start worrying about memory allocation. You know, like, there's so many ways of doing things. So. Cool. Thank you very much all.